my first political campaign. I never ran for anything in my life. So far, with only one exception, New Hampshire, I have scored either number one or number two in every single contest I've been in. I've won Alaska, won Hawaii, we won Nevada, I was second in South Dakota, and second in Kansas, second in Maine, and uh, it looks pretty good the rest of the South. <laughs> persuade evangelical leaders to vote for Bush? Well, because there are a lot of people who are interested in having the most qualified men for president. But they like their religion in South Carolina. Sure, and they appreciate the fact uh, that the vice president uh, is, is, a, is a man who exp has all his life uh, been a good Christian. Yes, we gave George Bush on paper many options of things to say to evangelicals to build relationships with them. You have to with any constituent group. Let me ask you a, a, a political question. Is that I interviewed the vice president. We were gonna show this videotape on selected television markets in the South. Tucked away in the middle were a few little evangelical buzzwords and a few little key questions that we wanted evangelicals in the South to hear. The debates in 1984, one of the uh, journalists asked both presidential candidates, have you been born again? How would you answer the question, the born again question? If it's defined as, um, do you accept Jesus Christ as your savior? I'm a clear cut affirmative to that. Clear cut. No, no hesitancy, no awkwardness. To thee I convinced Atwater that we could take out a Robertson church anytime we wanted to and there were 160 super churches in the South. We targeted them, we stripped Robertson's base. All you needed was one tithe-paying member of the board who supported George Bush, who'd walk in, sit down with the pastor, and says, I noticed you had tables out in the vestibule last Sunday for Robertson, I'd like to put a table out there for, for Bush. And most pastors would shut it down right there. They said, nope, this is a church, it's not political. Do you really think this thing is accidental that it came out two weeks before this election? Well, of course not. Man. You didn't just come into reporting yesterday. Did you? Are you <laughs> suggesting that Vice President George Bush engineered the swaggered revelations? I haven't said any such thing. You're the reporters. Go out and find yourself. One of the reporters no, came to me and asked me the question. Very I'm not suggesting George anything. I'm just saying two weeks before a crucial election, surely you've been in the business long enough. Knowing the quality of the people surrounding George Bush, there is nothing that I would not believe that they would do as racist. By about sundown tonight, sundown in the Old South, I'd like to see him stand up like a Southern gentleman with a little evidence or else to apologize. 200,000 voters, the most ever, turned out in South Carolina. George Bush got nearly as many votes as all the other candidates combined, leaving Dole and Robertson well behind. Now it's on to North Carolina and the other Super Tuesday states, where the candidates who didn't beat Bush in South Carolina are pinning their hopes. So I want to congratulate uh, George Bush, who was a fantastic run in the South, and uh, I want everybody to know that uh, we're not out yet. When the votes were counted on Super Tuesday, George Bush had defeated Pat Robertson in Georgia, Kentucky, Texas, Virginia, and 10 other Southern primaries. He told me at one meeting that God had told him that he was going to get elected president. I said, did he say when? Uh, because it isn't going to be this year. I think what happened was expectations got way out of line with reality. And I think the reason they did was because in caucus states, such as Michigan, such as Iowa, we were able to do the Green Beret thing. I thought the South was the Bible Belt and that they would really be excited about Pat Robertson. And it was a real blow, I think, when he didn't win the South. But there was no chance that the campaign could go on after Super Tuesday. It was over. Uh, we had won. I'm not proud of how we won, because we won with every trick in the books we could think of. This had not been a very pleasant three years. See that door? Get out! I'm a delegate. I want to go in.
please do totally, okay? And the day that Robertson gave his delegates to President Bush should have been a very exciting day for me. George Bush Jr. said his one stipulation is that you not be there. I think I teared up and, uh, you know, the battle was over. We'd won. Uh, why couldn't I be there? And it dawned on me that I guess uh, I was the symbol of something that bothered Pat Robertson. I sort of wanted to go down for all time and eternity as a vote for Pat Robertson, as a vote for Christian conservative politics, as a vote that really mattered. I mean, this was something that I had given months of my life to support, uh, a tremendous amount of effort, a great deal of money to be here representing the Christian conservatives. And now, all of a sudden, I was being asked just to forget everything I had worked for and join the group. The only reason I changed my vote was out of respect for Pat Robertson. Tonight, I release my delegates and alternates who have come to this convention and urge you and all of my friends across America to give your enthusiastic support to our party, to our platform, and our presidential and vice presidential nominees. There is no question that Dan Quayle was picked as vice president precisely because Robertson had been in the race. And had he not been in the race, you would have gotten some liberal vice presidential nominee, Alan Simpson maybe, or something like that. Uh, that's the reality of the situation. Uh, you don't uh, win at the negotiating table what you haven't won on the battlefield. I feel like you're getting from George Bush uh, what you need to hear in terms of to enthusiastically get behind him? Oh, yes, most definitely. He's saying most of the things that Pat Robinson was saying. Michael Dukakis turned out a number of hardened criminals. The most notable example was Willie Horton, who went into Maryland and terrorized the family. And you know the, the terrible story was written about in the Reader's Digest. He favored a program to give weekend furloughs to murderers who had not even served enough time, enough time to be eligible for parole. And one of them, Willie Horton, got out and raped and murdered again. As an aside, I should mention that Michael Dukakis is a card-carrying member of the ACLU. He says, I am a card-carrying member of the ACLU. Well, I am not a card-carrying member of the ACLU. There's a word that the Democrats did not mention once in their platform and not once in the acceptance speech of their candidate. It's a G word, the name of God. As Americans, we are not ashamed to pledge allegiance to a flag that is a symbol of one nation under God. Join me in this. We all know it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you and God bless. We were shocked, all of us shocked. We pulled 81% of the evangelical vote in the general election. We lost the Jewish vote, of course, which we lose. We lost the black vote, which we always lose. We lost the Hispanic vote, which we always lose. We lost all those votes. We were the first elected president in modern times to lose the Catholic vote. It meant you could win with just evangelicals. We won 81% of the evangelical vote. It had never been done before. Next time. There is a religious war going on in this country. This war is for the soul of America. We love Jesus! Yes, we do! We love Jesus! We will be the most powerful political force in American politics. God's Armies, the conclusion of With God on Our Side.
a presentation of South Carolina ETV in association with the Independent Television Service. With God on Our Side was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. Major funding was provided by the Pew Charitable Trusts, the Smith Richardson Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation, the William H. Donner Foundation, the Nathan Cummings Foundation, and the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. Additional funding was provided by the following. This is PBS.